Oh, sorry, I'm sneezing on camera. Taffer board. <laughs> <laughs> Take one. Yeah. So, what this is about is the permaculture design course and trying to promote the design course for people to, to get excited about it, basically. And I just want some people who've done the design course and got very excited about it and gone on and created an amazing right livelihood for themselves just to tell me a bit about how that happened, how they were motivated that much by permaculture to, to do that. Well it all started around about 1990 when we saw in grave danger of falling food um, with uh, Bill Mollison and um, I just thought what an amazing solution to so many environmental problems um, it could provide. We were just at the time um, about to buy a piece of field um, adjoining our uh, property and I wanted to create a wildlife garden and then I thought well this is silly, I mean, it, it, uh, a wildlife garden is great but why not produce food because you know so um, much energy goes into producing our food. This is something that I could actually do for the environment. So that's how that started. I then signed up for a forest garden design course with Patrick Whitefield. Um, uh, the idea of a forest garden um, sounded very appealing and something that I could do on this new plot of land. Um, I got thoroughly enthused by Patrick and um, learnt a lot more about the principles of permaculture and uh, took that away and started um, uh, designing um, the uh, garden um, along uh, permaculture design principles with a friend of mine, who uh, a friend of ours, who um, uh, had just completed his permaculture design course and so we sort of fed off each other's enthusiasm and um, between the three of us we, we created the garden that we have here now. Um, and then the opportunity to publish Permaculture magazine came along about a year later and that just fueled the enthusiasm even more started meeting a lot of people who'd seen in, in grave danger of falling food and had been sparked in a similar sort of way and we thought there's something very valuable here um, let's try and get this out to as many people as possible so permaculture magazine came about various permaculture books and permanent publications and that was um, uh, 13 14 years ago and um, so that's how we got to where we are today and uh, we had an opportunity about seven years ago to um, well I was going to say demolish half of our house but the back half of the house uh, which you see here um, was a 1960s 70s uh, extension very poorly done and it was demolishing itself it was fall, falling falling apart basically um, so it was either spend a lot of money just repairing it or spend a little bit more money and do a passive, full passive solar design on it. And that's the choice we, we, we made. Um, so I did my full permaculture design course. Um, actually, you did it yours first. Yes. Yeah, yeah, basically I had a baby in 1989 and then another one in 1993. So I had to sort of slot in a permaculture design course in the middle of babies and it was very difficult to, well, to leave a child for two weeks. And in 1992 um, there was a permaculture design course for women taught by Lee Harrison with childcare. And so I went with a friend and uh, our first daughter, who was by that time just two years old, and did a design course which was organised for women by women and at the same time just as we were finishing the design course Tim was just putting together the first issue of Permaculture magazine so it all happened at the same time and I came back and was yeah also hugely enthused by um, the idea of producing food and 
starting let systems and publishing. I mean, for instance, you know, we designed the forest garden, but we had to sort of interpret Australian literature with Robert Hart's forest gardening book. And so, you know, we said to Patrick, come on, let's do a how to make a forest garden, because it was quite difficult to put it all together. We're not trained horticulturalists and it was quite experimental and we thought if we produced a really practical book about the subject then people following after us wouldn't have, make the same mistakes and have to try and find the information and I think that's been our guiding principle with the book publishing particularly is, is right what do we want to know and what do other people want to know and how can we produce books that will um, help ordinary people, not builders, not horticulturists, not architects, do things like build ecological buildings, you know, plant gardens, um, start let systems, start community projects, etc. etc. And the guiding principle of the magazine was always to be as solution orientated as possible and to um, I think express the positivity and optimism and joy of permaculture. <laughs> Happy little dog. Um, because there is so much bad news and increasing bad news. Climate change is such a serious issue now. Peak oil for all its controversy I think is going to prove in the short term that it is a reality. and we are facing some unprecedented difficulties in the world and I think al although we have to face realities we need to see how people are designing their lives to be more abundant, more joyful, more intelligent and simpler as well and less chain to consumerism and, and the sort of life that we're being presented as um, the only option. So the idea of the magazine is to present positive alternatives that are attainable by ordinary people and really I, your criteria was always do I understand it, does it empower other people? You know, we don't have to have a university degree to be permaculture designers. We can, you know, we don't even have to have passed exams. It's not about academic thinking. It's about actually becoming more skilled and more capable in very practical ways. Mm. And I think that's why it inspired us. Mm. Yes, I've never been an academic. <laughs> and um... Which is very fortunate and very useful because Tim reads something and if it doesn't make sense to him then it's it's not a useful piece of information yeah. so they would then try and work out why uh, why it's not um, uh, easy to understand and then we make it understandable so um, hopefully that's what we achieve in in most of what we we publish but the permaculture design course itself is Mind I suppose blowing. it can be as academic as you want to make mm -hmm. it what you want to find in it you know there, there's so many avenues to explore and you can go to any depths but the fundamental information is so profoundly straightforward um, you know I'd felt after my design course like my brain had been turned inside out and I just saw saw things uh, at another depth of reality and um, you know it, you can then apply that thinking to virtually any aspect of, of uh, living and um, you know if it's that universal it has to be you know very very useful and I think these are the strategies we're going to need to um, survive in any kind of uh, simple comfort in in future years so how about the future for the magazine and for the permanent publications? Well, yes, it's an interesting question. Um, 
We certainly don't run five-year plans. If I... I mean, we look at the magazine. When we first started, we had 800 readers. 600. 600. We, we now have readers in 77 countries in the world. We have mainstream distribution in Canada, uh, America and the UK. And we... Um, we calculate we've probably got about 50,000 readers now. I mean, compared to a broadsheet newspaper, it's still relatively small. Um, but we see it as an organic growth that will continue. And we, the thing I think that is so powerful about permaculture itself is that it is something that can evolve as a way of thinking, as a way of doing, that it's not trapped in its origins, that it's constantly reassessing, adapting, evolving with the people that use it and, and where it's situated in the world. So most of our readers are in temperate climates, but not all by any means. And I'm seeing the magazine and the people, what people are sending me and what's inspiring the readers is changing, very much so. You know, the old cliché of permaculture being about sort of mulching and compost toilets is, is just going so fast now. And, and people are making the links between deep ecology, between arch architecture, community projects, technology, and... and Permaculture, I mean, I think an incredibly important aspect of permaculture is growing food because that's what requires, in a conventional system, so much energy, fossil fuels. And it's also, I think it makes people very happy growing food. It's tremendously empowering, it's very positive, it's something that anyone can learn to do. But I also see that the magazine, you know, keeping that core um, subject, but also exploring other aspects of living, how people can cooperate and live more harmoniously, um, and build their own technologies as well. And that's why we've had a bit of a preoccupation lately with cob and earth ovens, because anyone can build a cob structure. Mm -hmm. And, and it doesn't cost very much money. And I think all these low impact, low technology, um, simple ways of building, growing, living, are gonna come, become more and more relevant as we see um, fossil fuel economy just going out of the window. I mean, today, the day we're f you're filming this, oil has now hit 70, over $70 a barrel. And that will have a profound impact on the economic systems on, in the world. And of course it will hit poorer people far harder than the richer people. And so we have to equip ourselves with that information um, to insulate ourselves against what I think will be a very serious economic crisis in, in the world. And I think in many ways the North is going to be far more radically affected because the South still has community systems, low technologies, still has some sort of gene bank for growing food in, in not everywhere, but a lot of places. It's, it's in a way the, the North that's disenfranchised itself from the earth that is going to be far more vulnerable. So I see permaculture as being a fundamental strategy for survival in, in a changing world. And I believe that that design course creates tremendous hope and um, begins a process of, of deciding where to focus and, and learn skills. And I think actually everyone should do it. I mean, there shouldn't be any shoulds, but it would be a great... Um, service, I think, to society if many more people did a permaculture design course. I mean, the price of oil 
going up so much is actually going to make it much more, um, in terms of local economies, they make them much more viable. Yes. For instance, and local exactly. growers mm -hmm. yeah. can suddenly compete with yeah. imported food. And yeah. 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 Big changes. Big changes. Very big. And I think it's very frightening when, when we actually look at, you know, the projections for the future. It's very frightening. And certainly we won't be shipping books out all over the world. Mm -hmm. You know, we will change our way of presenting information. We'll have to. Um, and probably we will simplify our lives in the future and grow more food and be more self-reliant and we probably won't need to dedicate so much time on such an intense level to publishing. Um, we've often published slightly at the expense of our personal mm. well-being and I think that period will come to an end. And um, But I'm not quite sure what we're going to do about that yet. <laughs> I think the time will come when we'll be very, really, really valued for our permaculture knowledge and experience. Yes, I'd quite like to teach people things one day, rather than work with a screen. Um, I do teach at the moment, but I don't actually teach permaculture design. But at some point I'd probably like to leave the computerised existence and have more to do with human beings. But we've always felt that we didn't know why, but we just had to do what we did. We had to publish the Earth Care Manual by Patrick Whitefield without funding, without a funder dictating content. It had to be as close as we could mm. um, make it. Oh, I mean, Tim designed it. Um, and we felt a sort of strange compulsion <laughs> to do the things that we've done with the books and the magazine. But I'm sure that there'll come a time when we're not so necessary, and then we'll do other things. Hopefully by then everyone will have got the message. Well, I we hope so. Please make us obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah, great. Thank you. <laughs> there's lots there. Unless Good. there's anything else you want to chat about? I don't think so. Do you want so. to talk a little bit about the house? Yes. The okay. Just do it. God. Are you all right with me? Yeah, yeah, along? yeah. I'm used to it. <laughs> okay, so so the house at the front, <clears throat> um, as Tim said, we bought it with a handkerchief-sized garden, and um, it was rather ramshackle and tumble down. And uh, at the front, it's it's two one up, one down, nineteenth-century um, flint cottages built from local materials with a cow shed on the side that farm, got farm farm labourers farm labourers yeah mm. <coughs> and then at the back it is um, wavy well it was 1960s <coughs> flat roof hung tiles no insulation um, very rattly windows that were all rotting and we put in argon filled double glazed glazing and uh, we insulated the back of the house and we took the roof we took out the flat roof and and ran the roof line to the ridge and built a pitch there and the we thought about building in green oak but our friend our local friend because this is a local building of course um, he he hadn't got experience in in green oak so he said well I'd like to use Douglas fir and it's cheaper and I know how to work with that. And he basically machined all the parts of the passive solar glazed area in his workshop a mile down the road and put in the foundations and, and brought it here and sort of virtually put the frame up in a day. And, and all of the flint used at the back of the building, Tim swapped for a bottle of wine with a farmer who had a, a tumble down building that he didn't need the flints for so they they came locally as well i pretty much everything um was local or recycled um the part of the roof that we had to de demolish we took the tiles off it and reuse those and uh, we had to buy maybe 40 percent of the roof tiles more but 
we reused what we had. Um, the, the tiles that were hanging on the back um, wall got recycled onto the, the pitch of um, the conservatory. Um, as Maddie said, the flints came from a local farmer. The large um, that laps the back of the building was local. Came from a local timber merchant. Um, a sustainable timber merchant he was as well. And indeed the, the, the windows were manufactured locally as well. So we tried to just do everything as locally as possible. And we had to make some compromises. You yeah. know, we couldn't afford certain really top eco stuff. Um, and so we, we had to use materials that perhaps weren't as environmentally sound as we would have liked. But I, I think in the main it, it massively reduced the heating bills. It's a mm. lovely space to live in. And um, we have lots of light in winter and in the summer we grow climbers up to s stop it overheating. Particularly as we're at work all day so yes. we can't open the building. When, when we're at home though, you just open the windows downstairs and the windows upstairs and the whole and thing breathes the whole thing breathes mm. and, uh, and the roof's yes. a breathing roof and yeah. the walls are breathing walls as well it's all designed so that there's no condensation mm. so it works really well and we're really happy living here and our kids love it